When I first joined, I was, I drove the devotees mad with questions, just all during the day. I'm, here it says this, but there it says that, and what about this, and what about that? I was loaded with questions. When Prabhupada came, my, some of my questions had already been addressed, but I did have questions for Srila Prabhupada. One question I remember I asked him was, how it is that the spiritual master knows what the disciple is doing? My, the essence of my question is, was essentially, how do you get your brownie points? How do you get credit? If you do something and the spiritual master is not physically there, how does the spiritual master know what you're doing so that he'll be pleased and you'll get credit for it? That was, my, that was the intention of my question. So Prabhupada answered it in a, in a different sort of way. Srila Prabhupada said that everyone can, can tell. He said, when you're making progress, everyone can tell. Prabhupada said, face is the index of mind. So when you're making progress, spiritual progress, everyone can, can see. I remember on that walk that I went on, Prabhupada was mostly just chanting japa. You know, it was, it was, sometimes we heard that Prabhupada would say so many things on his walks. But this walk, I think it was the first one I went on, Prabhupada just was chanting on his beads mostly. But I asked a question. I asked him, how is it that since Vyasadeva was present at the time that Bhagavad Gita was spoken, how could we say that Bhagavad Gita was lost? Because Krishna, Brahma, Narada, Vyas. So at the time of Bhagavad Gita, Vyas was still there. So then why does Krishna say to Arjun that over the course of time the, the knowledge was lost? So I asked Srila Prabhupada that question. And Srila Prabhupada answered that that meant that it was not generally known. It was not generally known. Another time Srila Prabhupada came from Hawaii and he began his lecture by mentioning that the Honolulu Advertiser, the local paper, had run an article and they'd said that the Swami is a little man, a small man, but he has got a big message. And Prabhupada was quite happy with that. And there was one man who came, a, a, a respectable student or perhaps a grad student, and he had a question about Advaita philosophy. And he brought up the example of the drop of water merging into the ocean of water. But he'd, he'd asked it in, a, quite a, in the context of Advaita philosophy, so he was something of a knowledgeable person. And he asked about this, this merging of, of the soul into, into the supreme, the way the drop merges into the ocean. And in a way that showed that he, that this, that he was behind the idea, this seemed right to him. And Prabhupada answered that the drop may merge with the ocean, but then the drop will be evaporated. That the drop merges with the ocean, but then the sun comes and the drop is evaporated and it's no longer in the ocean. So it's a temporary situation. But if you become a fish, you become an aquatic, then you can dive in the ocean and remain there always. So Srila Prabhupada said that our philosophy is to merge deep into the ocean but maintain our individuality. So Prabhupada answered very brilliantly. Empty engagement, hardly anyone came, but this one intelligent person asked a question and Prabhupada just brilliantly answered him. One time in one evening program in, in New York, Rukmini asked a question. She asked, how is it if, if Krishna is, if Lord Chaitanya is Krishna, how did he show the six opulences? 
And Srila Prabhupada briefly answered. But then the next morning he called in Ishtagosti. Ishtagosti for Prabhupada meant a discussion of, of Krishna Katha. Later Ishtagosti came to mean like a gripe session or a management meeting. But Prabhupada's idea of Ishtagosti was some discussion about Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada called in Ishtagosti. He came and sat, which was unusual. I don't rec- recall any. I don't recall any other time when Prabhupada had a, a meeting in the morning. But he called in Ishtagosti. We all came, and Prabhupada led Kirtan. And then he said about your question, Rukmini's question. And then he went into it in detail. He told how Lord Chaitanya was very beautiful. He said now uh, the People were after fair skin, and Lord Chaitanya was very fair skin. He was called Gorsundar. He was uh, coming, he was learned also. He was known as Nimai Pandit, uh, very beautiful, very uh, learned. So he had probably in that way described different opulences. But then he said his main opulence was his renunciation. And he told how he had his. Uh, wife, Vishnu Priya, and his elderly mother, but he left everything, uh, renunciation. So Prabhupada emphasized that opulence of Lord Chaitanya. One time, S. Srila Prabhupada asked me, he said, why are you so skinny? <laughs> I don't know if you remember <laughs> Another time, Satsurup Maharaj, because he was the temple president, gave me some little booklets. They were published by a, a well-known spiritual press in India, and they were dealing with Krishna. Uh, they were dealing with Krishna. And the question was whether it was okay for us to read these books. And Srila Prabhupada so he gave me the books and said, you know, could you ask Srila Prabhupada whether it's all right to read these books, little booklets. So I went into Srila Prabhupada's room, I brought the booklets, and I asked Srila Prabhupada, is it all right to read these books? Srila Prabhupada said, it is not required. But Prabhupada's meaning was, no. But I didn't understand that, because I was com- where I was coming from, there were elective subjects and there were required subjects. And the required subjects were the ones you had to take, and the elective subjects were optional. So I, I came back to Srila Prabhupada that, all right, they're not required, but is it all right? <laughs> we went back and forth that way a couple of times before it dawned on me that not required means if it's not required, why do it? Forget it. So the answer was no. There was one engagement I remember at, I believe it was at Harvard, in fact. Prabhupada spoke in a classroom. And the professor, as I recall, was Indian. Perhaps he was even Bengali, but he was Indian. And he raised some question about Krishna and the gopis. And Prabhupada just, I I don't recall the substance of what Prabhupada said, but I remember Prabhupada just like, becoming very stern with him, very strong. And the, the, the thrust of his response was, you know, who are you? What is your qualification to understand these things? And you're just misunderstand. Don't take it as mundane. That, you'll, that this, is, this is above your head, Krishna and the gopis. Just try to understand what is Krishna. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Try to understand from Bhagavad Gita. And you're, you're going to talk about Krishna and the gopis. What, what right do you have? That was, not in so many words, but that was the, the thrust of it. And probably, I just remember Prabhupada, like, his eyes flashing and he probably becoming very animated, you, you know, that this person is talking about Krishna and the gopis in, in some academic con- context. What does he know? What right does he have to be discussing these things? That was the, 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 the gist of it. In Boston, there was a young man coming. 
named Eddie, who was a hairdresser and who was a follower of some yogi that he came very attracted to Srila Prabhupada. And he came up to Boston, I think he was from New York, came up to Boston to be with Srila Prabhupada. He brought some of his friends. And he would, when Prabhupada came, came in, and he would like help Prabhupada on with his shoes or help Prabhupada off with his shoes. He said, oh, you are so nice. He was very attractive. And on one morning walk, I didn't go on that walk, but I was told that he asked Srila Prabhupada if he could be initiated. And Prabhupada said, first you have to learn the philosophy. First you should know the philosophy. And then he said that if today you come on sentiment, tomorrow you will leave on sentiment. Which is what happened. He didn't stay. One thing that happened was that one day an, a, an elderly gentleman showed up. Just during the day, Prabhupada, was, Prabhupada still had his apartment at 26, and the temple was down the street, about a block, two blocks away. And an elderly gentleman came with a letter from Srila Prabhupada that he'd received in Prabhupada's absence. And the letter said that when I come to New York, then you can come see me and we can discuss. So here's this man with his letter. Okay, so Brahmananda had me take the gentleman over to Srila Prabhupada's apartment. And the gentleman was very respectful. He was, he said to Srila Prabhupada, Swamiji, I, I, I like your, your, your teachings very much. But one thing is that one of your disciples said that such and such uh, person is a rascal. He, he mentioned a big uh, spiritual person from India, a big name. Is such a, your, one of your disciples said that such and such person is a rascal. And it seems to me that he's a very holy person. And I don't, one of your disciples said that you said that, that such and such person is a rascal. And I don't understand why you'd say that, because it seems to me that he was a very a saintly person. And Prabhupada said, who has said this? Who has said this? And the man said, you didn't say it. Prabhupada said, if he says that I have said, and I have not said, then he is rascal. Then Prabhupada became, then the man became quite settled up. It was, now he was relieved. Prabhupada hadn't said that. Then Prabhupada took a book, a little blue hardbound volume from his shelf, and took it down and opened it up, uh, showed, showed the book to the man, said, you know this book? And the man said, oh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, Vedanta Society, oh, yeah, he was quite pleased. He opened the book and he said, um, read, read this verse. So the verse was, Manmana bhava mad bhakta mad yaji nam namaskaru. So the man was, so the man read that, become, uh, always think of me, become my devotee, offer your homage to me, worship me. Prabhupada said, yes, he was a very good scholar, he was translated very nicely. Now, the commentary, what does he say? Read. The man began reading. It is not to Krishna that we have to surrender, but to the all-pervading such and such within Krishna. Prabhupada said, just see. Therefore I say they are all rascals. <laughs> Therefore I say they are all rascals. Then Prabhupada quoted, of course, Namam duskrita namudha prabhajante naradhama maya prithagyana asura bhavamashrita. Anyone who doesn't surrender to me, uh, he's miscreant, he's uh, lowest of men, his knowledge is stolen by illusion, he's demonic in nature. Prabhupada explained all of these words at some length. And then Prabhupada said, It is not my saying, 
It is Krishna saying, what can I do? There was another occasion where Srila Prabhupada did quite a large initiation at 61 Second Avenue. There was a photograph of Srila Prabhupada walking back to his apartment after the ceremony. And you can see ecstatic devotees dancing with their no shoes and so on. Everybody's in bliss after the ceremony. And Srila Prabhupada was just walking back very gravely with his characteristically with his head held high. And he didn't say anything. Then he said, we have increased the disciple succession from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Prabhupada at that time, he quoted some verses from, from Chaitanya Bhagwat. There's a, a verse about Muchi and Suchi. Prabhupada quoted, at least that was the first time we heard it. And Prabhupada explained it, that the Muchi means a cobbler, who's the lowest class of man. He makes his business skinning animals and taking the skins to make shoes. And Shuchi is the most pure, the Brahmin. But the person who's Shuchi becomes Muchi if he's Yadi Krishna Tyaji, if he gives up Krishna consciousness. And the person who's Muchi becomes Shuchi, Yadi Krishna Bhaji, if he takes up Krishna consciousness. Well, Prabhupada explained that verse at that time. He, he, he liked that verse. And he, Prabhupada explained also that these people are claiming that I'm Brahmin because I was born in a Brahmin family. So Prabhupada said, that means I have Brahmin skin. He said, they're skin dealers, that's all. That means they're muchi. Now they're thinking, I'm Brahmin, but they're skin dealers. I've got Brahmin skin. There's an instruction that I didn't hear firsthand but I heard from a devotee named Uttama Shloka, not the Uttama Shloka from America, there was a German disciple at one point named Uttama Shloka. And he came to 61 Second Avenue. And he was telling something about his experience with Srila Prabhupada. And one thing that he told us that Srila Prabhupada had instructed, which has always stuck with me, is that Srila Prabhupada had told him just try to hear yourself chant sincerely. Just try to hear yourself chant sincerely. There was another example Prabhupada gave in that, during that time in New Vrindavan. Prabhupada said that, of course, Krishna is light and Maya is darkness. So Prabhupada gave the example that you hold your palm like this, it's in the light and you turn your palm like this, it's in the darkness. So it's, it's up to us, turn toward Krishna or away from Krishna. Therefore we're called marginal energy, we can turn either way. The devotees at that time had purchased a cow, but they hadn't purchased the calf that the cow had just had. And the cow is crying. They had the cow in the field, and the cow even ran an electric fence, you know, length, the length of her body through the electric fence. You know, where is my calf? So then, they, after that, I think probably gave an instruction, and they tried to get the calf also, but it was not possible. But Prabhupada noted it, and he, he mentioned on some later occasion that they, they say that the animal has no soul. But just see how the, the cow is crying for her, her calf. In December of 1969, Srila Prabhupada again came to Boston, and I was there. I think the press must have been there at that time. And Srila Prabhupada was staying in a little house way, quite a long distance from the temple, up in a suburb someplace. And there was a lot of snow, and we had to go through these winding roads, and finally came to Prabhupada's house. Prabhupada was not in very good health. The, the winter was not agreeing with him. It was quite a serious cold. But he called us to his house. Hayagriva, Pradumna, Kirtananda Marj was there. Satsurup Marj came. I came. 
basically the people who were involved with BTG. And Srila Prabhupada called a meeting. Prabhupada, just at that time, he was teaching us how to have meetings. Until then, we were just doing things. Now Prabhupada taught us how to, me- how to have a meeting. And he began by having, a, having kirtan, and then there was some discussion. And Prabhupada several times repeated that pattern in different venues. That this is how you have a meeting. You have kirtan, and you discuss. So Prabhupada was training us. So Prabhupada began... So Prabhupada began explaining what should be the editorial policy for BTG. At that time, Hayagriva and Satsuruk Maharaj were the co-editors. And Prabhupada explained that there are four levels of Krishna consciousness, or four levels of, yeah, four levels that should be addressed. First level is how to awaken someone, how to awaken him to Krishna consciousness. People are sleeping in illusion, in maya. So we have to awaken them. Uh, That's the first stage. Then the second stage is how to train them. How to train them to be Krishna conscious. Someone comes forward, Swamiji, please accept me, please initiate me. So the second stage is training. Then the third stage is understanding Krishna's different energies, Radha Krishna Lila is on that stage. And the fourth stage, Prabhupada said, is Paramhansa stage. Always absorbed in the dream of Krishna. So that way, Prabhupada said. So he said this back to Godhead should be on the first two stages. How to awaken someone and how to train someone. <coughs> Radha Krishna and those kind of subject matters, they're not meant for the general public. How to awaken someone and how to train him. These were the subject matters. Either for Dumna or, or Kirtananda Maharaj asked if we could print Brahma Sangita, whether we could print Brahma Sangita in Back to Godhead. And Prabhupada was not very much in favor of it because it was highly, it was very dense. Prabhupada then he said, in small installments. He said, in small installments. He said, it will puzzle their brains. He said, my spiritual master used to speak from the highest elevated platform. And when he, when he spoke it, he said it in such a way that I, somehow the room was just filled with effulgence as Prabhupada was speaking, or it seemed to me that the room was just filled with effulgence. And the way he spoke about his spiritual master, he used to speak from the highest. I, it, you know, I could just picture practically a, you know, a throne so many feet up and the spiritual master speaking. Prabhupada just spoke with such regard for his spiritual master. Then Prabhupada began telling the whole story of how he'd, he'd met his spiritual master, how he'd been dragged by his friend Narendra Malik, and one thing led to another thing, and, and Prabhupada uh, came. And Prabhupada explained that he said, I, that I used to... He said, I, even when he would speak in... Be- Prabhupada said, he used to speak from the highest elevated platform. He said, even when he would speak in Bengali, I could not understand. He said, but I would go on hearing. That was my policy. And my spiritual master noticed that this boy likes to hear. That I would understand or not understand, but I would go on hearing. And because I was enthusiastic about hearing, now I'm in Shravanam, now I'm enthusiastic about preaching, kirtan. Because I was enthusiastic about hearing, now I'm enthusiastic about preaching. In 1969, we were at ISKCON Press in Boston. We were working on Second Canto, another work. And Srila Prabhupada was out in San Francisco. The Ratiyatra was coming up, and some devotees got the idea that the whole group of us, all the press workers, could pile in a van, drive across the country in two days, be there with Srila Prabhupada for the Ratiyatra, and then turn around and come back and be back in Boston and keep going. So somehow it came to Srila Prabhupada's attention, and Prabhupada said, what do they want to come out here for? They should go on with their 
their work, their prescribed duties. So from that we understood that association with the spiritual master is not just by physical proximity, but it's by our devotional service. Not being with him just on the scene, but being with him by serving him. It was also around that time, 1969, that it became important to identify Srila Prabhupada as Foundracharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. At first it was just A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, then A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, then Foundracharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. That began while we were working on Second Canto. We were publishing it chapter by chapter in booklets. And we got the message from the West Coast that we were supposed to do this, but somehow the message got garbled. So we only had founder of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And then Prabhupada was unhappy. He was upset with us. So then again the message came back, and so we ran it through the press again, running a black line through that founder line and doing it again, Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So again, of course, it was wrong. Finally, we got it right, founder Acharya. And since then, of course, that's been there. Prabhupada was very particular about that. He foresaw that it would be important that the position of the founder Acharya of the society, specifically that his position as founder Acharya, should be well established. I remember when Srila Prabhupada later came to Los Angeles when the press was in L.A., he passed by the BBT building, a new, our newly occupied BBT, BBT building, and saw the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust. And underneath it, it didn't say Founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada. And Radha Balaba, who was in charge of things in those days, got, it, got blasted by Srila Prabhupada. Even though he had the letters in a box, they were ready to go, they just hadn't been put up yet. But Srila Prabhupada chewed him out anyway. That why is this missing? Prabhupada considered it very crucial. He issued a, a, a letter, in fact, at one point to all the centers that on all the letterhead, on all the cards, all the publications of the society, this line had to be there. Founder Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Prabhupada foresaw how significant it would be, how important it would be for us and for others to understand the society properly with its founder Acharya. In New York, in perhaps 1974, Srila Prabhupada came to Brooklyn. At that time, the press was there. And Srila Prabhupada called me in one day to his quarters. And I remember he was sitting on a platform. He had a freshly shaved head, and he was sitting very regally and aristocratically. And he asked me concerning the manager of the press at that time, Adwaita Das. Yes, I heard that Adwaita is not attending the programs. Adwaita and perhaps Uddhava, who was his uh, colleague. I've heard that Adwaita is not attending the programs. Is that a fact? Well, of course, I didn't want to be tattletale, but I said, well, Srila Prabhupada, I, and I admitted that that was probably so. Prabhupada said, go over there and tell them to close the press. We do not need this press. If they cannot come to the programs, it's better to close the press. And up to that time, Prabhupada had been putting tremendous emphasis on the importance of, of our press activities. On he, he was giving money for it. He was emphasizing it. Devotees were working very hard on the press activities. And Prabhupada told me, go over there and tell them, we do not need this press. Better to close the press. Prabhupada considered it very important that we keep up our standard activities of sadhana, our standard devotional activities. Better to close the press. Another time, Srila Prabhupada was sitting in his quarters in Brooklyn on, on Henry Street, and he was taking his massage. I think someone had, had gotten him a, a machine, and the, the, his secretary, his assistant, was trying it out, giving Prabhupada a massage with this little vibrator. And Bhardraj Prabhu came in, and he was asking, he had some questions to ask about pictures. 
But Prabhupada had an issue to, to take up with him. Prabhupada said, what are these bust pictures? What Prabhupada meant were pictures of the Acharyas, just head and shoulders. Prabhupada didn't consider the, pick those kinds of pictures appropriate. And he instructed Bharaj that the full form should be there. He said, the pictures are not for worship, they are for decoration. He said, Bande Guru Sri, and he pointed to his foot, Charanada Vindam. In July of 1971, Sai, who later became Siddha Supananda, joined our society. He was a person who was a yogi and a, a guru, a young American man. And he was carrying on his own Krishna consciousness movement. But then he surrendered to Srila Prabhupada, and his followers also joined. And many of them came to New York. And Srila Prabhupada held initiations. And of course, all the devotees had names already. And the girls mostly had very nice poetic names like Lalita and Radharani and, and so on. And Prabhupada gave them completely different names. As I recall, he gave names like Chaya, which, which means shadow, and other names that were mostly names of Durga, names of, of Maya, the illusory energy. And one girl he named as Mahamaya. And some of the devotees laughed. And Prabhupada said, don't laugh. He said, this is serious. Prabhupada said that several times at initiations. Devotees would say, oh, and they'd laugh. But Prabhupada would say, you should be grave. It is serious. So this devotee, Mahamaya, Prabhupada said, Mahamaya is another face of Radharani. Prabhupada did many initiations, mass initiations, in New York City. He used to come in the summer, and so many devotees would come from different centers. And I remember on one occasion, it's a very large initiation, many first initiates, many second initiates. And Srila Prabhupada instructed the, the temple presidents and GBC men, have you scrutinized these lists? Prabhupada said, for first initiation, we can be lenient, but second initiation, we should be strict. So then, of course, the president started cutting names from the second initiation list. And I remember, in particular, one devotee from New York whose name was cut, just through a tantrum. You know, what do you mean I'm not qualified to be a Brahmin? <laughs> completely passionate, completely over the top. So Prabhupada knew what he was doing. We should be a little strict about second initiation. One of the earliest devotees was a devotee named Ray Rama. He joined before Satsuru Maharaj, before many of the others. And he was very dedicated in, to helping Srila Prabhupada, and very impressive also. He was one of the first editors. He and Hayagriva were the first editors of Back to Godhead. He was the ed original editor for Teachings of Lord Chaitanya. He knew the philosophy practically better than anyone, in New York at least, because he'd been reading all the books in advance, and practically no one else had even read them. And he used to be terrifyingly good in answering questions. Hippies and others would come, and, and he would speak. He would just cut them expertly. And after I was working in his office, typing and so on, but after I'd been around for not that long, a few months, he left. He left the boat. He left the society. And then, so that was 1968 or early 69. And then in 1971, when we were at Henry Street, and the press was on Tiffany Place, one day he showed up at the press. And he came and said that he wanted to revive his service. And he was asking about Prabhupada and coming forward. And so he wrote a letter to Srila Prabhupada that I've come back to New York and I want to do some service, want to join again. And I thought that Srila Prabhupada would be just very happy to get back such a, a long-lost devotee back into the society. But when Srila Prabhupada's answer came back, perhaps it was from India, it was in a very different mood. Srila Prabhupada wrote to him and said that you're welcome to come back, but not with your independence. Not with your independence. Prabhupada had detected in his letter that 
his materialistic mentality was still there. And Prabhupada said that you are one of that if you want to join, you're welcome, but then you have to follow the all the regulative principles, you have to get up early in the morning and attend the programs and so on. He said otherwise it's a bad example. You can understand as one of the senior people that it's a bad example for the other devotees. He said, so if you want to keep if you want to join, you are welcome. But if you want to keep your independence, it will not be helpful for you or for anyone else. And I think that Srila Prabhupada knew that that meant he would say, well, then I can't join. But that was the way Prabhupada put it to him. He just laid it on the line that if you, if you want to join and surrender, then you're, you're welcome back full-heartedly. But if you want to join, but not really join, if you want to join, but really keep a separate mentality, have your own agenda, then why do it? Why, why cheat? And he, he left, and we never saw him again. Another time in Henry Street, Srila Prabhupada called me into his office. We'd been sending him photocopies of some of the layouts of the, the, the laid out pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. We were working on fourth canto at that time, Dhruva Maharaj and so on. And we'd been sending some photocopies. And Srila Prabhupada called me into his office and asked me in. And, and then he, he was looking at the photocopy and he said, why is it Lord Manu? And I said, well, I, I don't know, Srila Prabhupada, I said, it shouldn't be Lord Manu. Prabhupada said, Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, Lord Manu. Prabhupada, said, it shouldn't be, no, it shouldn't be. So, of course, then I, I later on looked back at the, or went back to the original tape, and the reason it was Lord Manu is that Prabhupada had said Lord Manu. So, going back and trying to extract the purport, I took it as an instruction that Srila Prabhupada wanted our, the editors to be very scrutinizing. That was Prabhupada's word that he used most often for editors, that an editor should be scrutinizing. So, perhaps there was nothing really wrong in those pages, but Prabhupada picked on this point. Why Lord Manu? Just to emphasize the editors should be very careful. Nothing should be quickly passed, passed over. That was the purport that I extracted from it. When the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam was first published, it was 1972. And Satsrut Maharaj and I had both noticed that there were things in the editing that didn't quite match the original, because we had the original Bhagavatams, of course. And it was, we mentioned it to Srila Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said, just print it. Prabhupada was not in the mood to see these books slowed down for anything. And especially since we brought it, practically the books were ready to print, and then we'd come up with some, some issue, just print it. So we did. Um, and Prabhupada said nothing further about it, and we said nothing further about it. But in 1975 or 76, I did a review of especially the first of the first canto of the Bhagavatam. And I saw that there were many places, especially in the first two chapters, and especially in the translations to the first two chapters, where there were major discrepancies, where Sanskrit words that prob where the translations for Sanskrit words in the text that Prabhupada had translated had been left out in the editing where something had been misunderstood, where simply it had been done to less of a standard than we thought the book deserved. And again, the first canto has, it, it, the editor did a wonderful job of editing first canto and second canto. Uh, he did a uh, a wonderful service to Srila Prabhupada and, and to, the, to the readers. But when I looked at the first two chapters especially, because by then, before 
we had there was no regular Bhagavatam class with regular chanting of the Sanskrit verses and reading the word for word synonyms. Prabhupada instituted that a little later. And then after we got familiar with, with the book by going through that system, we could see that there were things that were really missing. And missing or, or wrongly wrongly stated. So I went through those through the first canto and especially with attention to the first two chapters and I did a revision. And again the revision was especially strong on, on the translations for those two chapters. That's where I did the most work. So I typed them up and I put them in an envelope and when Srila Prabhupada came to 55th Street in New York to uh, visit the temple, I, I w went up to his room basically to, to leave this there for him to see and you know, to, to give his approval or disapproval. There was a cover letter and, and so on saying what I'd done and, and I thought I'll just leave this here and, and come back or you know, wait for a reply. And instead, Srila Prabhupada was, was sitting right there and I offered my obeisances and Prabhupada, you know, I came in basically kind of said what I was there for and Prabhupada had me start reading them. He start, had me start reading the translations, the revised ones. So I read the well, first few verses, two, three, four, and Prabhupada listened quite attentively. And then he stopped me and said, so what you have done, what you have done. I said, well, Srila Prabhupada, I, I went through the verses and, and revised them, mainly to make them closer to what you have said, what you originally said. Prabhupada said, what I have said? And I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, then it is all right. Sometimes we think that you know, everything Prabhupada said is just all about Krishna, but Prabhupada sometimes talked about other things. He'd talk about British history and there'd be no apparent connection. One time Prabhupada went on a walk in Central Park in New York City and I didn't go. And when the devotees came back, I asked them, you know, what did Prabhupada talk about? And the first devotee I asked said, well, he told the story of the Merchant of Venice. And I said, well, what was the point? And he said, uh, he just told the story. So I thought there must have been some point. I went to another devotee who had been on the walk. And what did Prabhupada talk about? He talked about the merchant of Venice and told the story. Well, what was the point? No, he just told the story. What had happened, there's a statue in, in Central Park of Daniel Webster, the famous American statesman. And Prabhupada saw the, stand, the statue and say, oh, said, oh, Daniel has come. There's a line in the merchant's, merchant of Venice, a veritable Daniel. So Prabhupada said, oh, Daniel has come. And then he started telling the whole story of the merchant of Venice. And there was no purport, there was no, he just told the story and that was it. So Prabhupada was conversant with English literature, English history, and sometimes he would just talk about these things. That's the prerogative of a pure devotee, to talk about whatever he wants to talk about. Another time I was on a walk with Srila Prabhupada. It was one of those walks where you drive in a car someplace and go on a walk and drive back. We'd gone for a walk, perhaps it was on the East River in, in New York, in Brooklyn, and we were driving back, and I was in the car with Srila Prabhupada. We were coming back to Henry Street, and on the corner of the, the street, there's a, a mailbox. And as we were pulling up to the temple, there was a man with a little boy, and the man was picking up the little boy, and the boy was putting the letter in, in the box. And the whole vignette just lasted for, oh, a few, a few seconds. But Prabhupada just became fixed on, on the scene. He was in the car and he was seeing. And as he was seeing, his eyes got very large and, and, and brilliant. And he just became just absorbed in this, this scene. And it's, this is all of five seconds, ten seconds. And you could just see that Prabhupada was 
nothing else was on his attention. He was ab just absorbed in this. And I'm thinking, well, maybe Prabhupada's remembering something from his childhood in Calcutta or something maybe. Then Prabhupada, the, the, the man put his boy down, and, and Prabhupada said, the little boy on his own, he cannot do. But the affectionate father, when he helps, then it is possible. So on our own, living entities, what power do we have? But when the, the Lord or the spiritual master gives their affectionate help, then it becomes possible. In July of 1975, Srila Prabhupada went to San Francisco, I believe for the Ratha Yatra. And I went on one morning walk with him, and Krishnadas was there, who had, as a young, young boy, had gone to Germany and done a lot of very nice service. And he'd sort of drifted away. And now he was, he'd come to be with Prabhupada on this, this walk. And perhaps revive more of his service spirit. And on that walk, I remember that Srila Prabhupada talked about many subjects. One subject was the feeling of separation from the spiritual master, perhaps Krishna also, but especially he mentioned separation from the spiritual master. And, or feelings of separation, anyway, he mentioned. And Krishnadas said to Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, you must always be feeling separation from your Guru Maharaj. And the question was sort of a, a prompt. It was a way of saying, Srila Prabhupada, could you speak about your feelings of separation from your Guru Maharaj? And Prabhupada responded, that you do not require. Which was Prabhupada's idiomatic way of saying, none of your business. And then Prabhupada got in his car and, and went. He didn't say it in a, in a mean way or, or abrasive way. He just said, that you do not require. I sometimes used to take a break from my stationary editing position and travel, especially with Satsurup Maharaj and his library party, visiting colleges. And in the course of traveling, I came to Detroit in 1976 in the summer when Srila Prabhupada was there. We deliberately, of course, went there to be with him. And I remember that one time I said to Srila Prabhupada, because he, we were talking about our service, what we were doing, I said, Srila Prabhupada, it's so difficult to convince the students to give up sense gratification. And Prabhupada said, we do not say give up, said, but regulate. So in that way, he was correcting my understanding and also, I think, giving an indication of how we should present the philosophy. So we don't say give up sense gratification, but regulate. Prabhupada given the example other times that sense gratification is like salt. Too much salt and you can't eat, and too little salt you also can't eat. It has to be regulated. That Detroit temple had been purchased with the funds given by Ambarish Prabhu and Lekha Srivanti Dasi. She, of course, was well connected with people in the labor community in the city of Detroit because she was coming from a uh, family where her, her father was, was an important labor leader, a leading labor leader in the city of Detroit. So she, had, she knew people in, in, in office. And she brought one time a local politician, perhaps a, a state representative or something like that, to meet with Srila Prabhupada. A very respectful black gentleman who came to, to see Srila Prabhupada along with like a Srivanti. And Prabhupada received him very cordially. And of course, Detroit is such an opulent temple and they have beautiful deities there. They have Gornitai deities. I believe they have Jagannath deities. And they have Radha Kunja Bihari, very tall, 
uh, marble deities, Krishna's black marble and Radharani's white marble. So Srila Prabhupada said to this gentleman that, so you have seen the deity? You've seen Krishna? And the gentleman had brought, been brought to the temple, so he said yes. Prabhupada said yes. He said, Krishna is also coming from your community. One year in Mayapur, I remember the Lotus Building was still in con under construction, and so we were, the, the roof was, was still cement and, and bars and so on. But we were living in the building in whatever state it was in. And that year, a devotee named Gayatri Dasi from Gainesville had baked a cake and sent to, it had come along to Mayapur like with her husband, or somehow this came. And it fell into the hands of the sannyasis. <laughs> they were the senior guys, and they, they were able to commandeer the, they, they, this cake. They got this cake, and they all did it up. But she had traveled from Miami to perhaps London, and finally on to Delhi, and then on to Calcutta, and then the drive to Mayapur. So many days and hours and hot sun, and this cake had become poison. And I remember seeing sannyasis just writhing in pain, laid out on the, on the roof of the Lotus Building, just retching and, and wretched, and devote I, I was glad I wasn't a sannyasi at the time. I was just a brahmachari. But they were, they were, we, we were, you know, what to do? We have to just take them to a hospital. These, these men could die. Prabhupada said that they should take some charnamrita from the deities and they would be all right. Just regularly take some charnamrita, they'll be all right. And they were. One time, I don't remember the context, but I was, I think Radha Balava and I were standing on, on the veranda in Mayapur with Srila Prabhupada. And I remember it was warm weather and Prabhupada had a freshly shaved head and perhaps he wasn't wearing more than just an anuttariya to cover his chest. And he was standing in the sunlight, as I recall. And Prabhupada just sort of rubbed his head in a characteristic way. And he said, anything good you want to do, he said, you'll have to go through so much trouble. I believe it was on that same walk, we suddenly came to a, a kind of a, a mandap. There was a raised concrete platform with a, like a, a roof, like a tin roof over it. And if I recall, there was a little music playing. And Prabhupada got up on the mandap to see. And he saw that it was a deity of Durga. And Prabhupada offered his full dandavats before the Durga deity. Then, as I remember, he sat up perhaps on his knees and he was looking at the deity. And he was saying that he, he quoted Shristi Stiti Pralaya Sadhana Shakti Reka Chayeva Yasya Bhuvanani Bibharti Durga. That Durga is also conducting her affairs in obedience to the order of Govinda. He said, So the gopis said, We are also offering our respect to Durga, but not like the materialists. Give me this, give me this, give me this. The gopis were worshipping Katyayani which means Durga, uh -huh. that my dear uh, goddess, you're always carrying out the order of Krishna, so you're very dear to Krishna, you're his devotee, so please give us your benediction so that we can become engaged in the service of Krishna. In that way, Prabhupada said. And Prabhupada said it very feelingly. I remember Prabhupada practically he had tears in his eyes. And he was speaking very feelingly, offering respect to, to Durga. 
in relationship to Krishna. He used to come down from his room in Bombay, from his quarters, although his health wasn't good, his health was quite poor, but he would come down for the Guru Puja. And he told us one time, this Guru Puja is very important. This Guru Puja you should attend, it's very important. And he he was explaining the the song, Sri Guru Charna Padma. At one point he came to a line, he said, what is that line? Or he was asking for a line, he said, every day you are singing these these verses, but you do not know what they mean. He was cross with us. And he considered it very significant. The last Bombay Pandal program that Srila Prabhupada did was in 1977, March, March 23rd, 24th. And Srila Prabhupada's health was extremely bad. He, I remember that his, he was so weak that Prabhananda and, and Tamal Krishnamaj used to, they would just carry Prabhupada onto the stage. On his own strength, he, he couldn't get onto the stage. They would just carry him and practically just deposit him on the asana. And Prabhupada, I remember the first day, Prabhupada sitting, and he's just, um, how to say it, just seemed to be no energy, just sitting in, in, in almost exhaustion of, of energy, sitting on the asana. And he had Bhavananda read from Bhagavatam. And Bhavananda, it was from the section Svavid Varahostra Karaya Samstita Purusha Pushu, second canto. So he had him read, and then Prabhupada began to speak. I remember his opening words were that I have come to encourage you and be encouraged by you. And he didn't say much, just very little bit, and then Prabhupada would have Bhavananda read more, and, and Prabhupada was sitting. You know, just kind of without energy, sitting on the stage, and Bhavananda would read, and then Prabhupada would say a few words, and Bhavananda would read, and Prabhupada would say a little more, and Bhavananda would read more, and then Prabhupada would say more, and soon Prabhupada was speaking and speaking, and soon he was roaring. Prabhupada got so inspired that he just began preaching triple strong, so that at the end of the lecture he was just full of power and full of energy and full of strong preaching. And he finished his talk and then he called for questions. And I remember some of the questions on, on these two days. One person got up and, saw, and said that, I see that you have got the picture of Krishna, but you are not having any picture of Ram. Why there is no picture of Ram? And the man said, and Prabhupada said, the name is there. And again, the man was saying, but there's no picture. And Prabhupada, but the name is there. And Prabhupada just strongly was preaching that there's no difference between the name and the person whose name it is. And just drove that point home. Another time, another question, a man got up, sort of a sophisticated college-educated, intellectually, uh, intellectual sort of a person or a person with an intellectual kind of a demeanor and got up and said, Sir, can you prove by logic that there is God? And Prabhupada said, You do not know what is logic. And again the man said, Sir, can you, can you demonstrate, can you prove by logic, that there is God. And Prabhupada said, you do not know what is logic. And I think a third time, sir, by logic, can you prove? You do not know what is logic. There is a mother, material nature, and there are, there are children, the living entities. Therefore, there must be a father. That's logic. Now take it. 
And the crowd just cheered. It was so great how Prabhupada just finished it. That's logic. Now take it. Another man asked, because Prabhupada talked about how one could become an animal in the next life, and a man got up and said, gave the argument, so if we become an animal, if I become an animal, I'll have the consciousness of an animal, consciousness of an animal, and so living as an animal will be, I'll be happy as an animal. People sometimes give that argument. This man gave that argument. So then it, it, it will be all right. Uh, it will not be bad. So Prabhupada answered, he said, if it is not bad, he said, that, that is all right. But we do not think that kind of life is very nice. The man sat down. One time at an airport, Prabhupada was sitting with the devotees, and someone had brought some prasadam. And they gave Srila Prabhupada whatever it was. Prabhupada took a little piece. Now he said, now distribute. So we were sitting in the airport. So many devotees were there. So many other people were there. And so the devotee asked to, to the, you know, to who to distribute it to, to the general public. Prabhupada said, no, charity begins at home. At one airport departure, Prabhupada was sitting, and one devotee child was there, a young toddler. And the, this toddler began to explore. He started to go off and explore the airport, just took a few steps, Prabhupada said. Oh, he is very brave. And then, after a few steps more, the child looked around. He didn't see his mother, and his face began to wither, and he began to cry. So Prabhupada said, that's like our position, that we want to become independent, but then when we become independent, we're in so much difficulty. One time, Achyutanandamar sent an article of some discussions that he'd had with His Holiness Sridhar Maharaj. And this was very early in his con, when, when Achyutananda and maybe two other devotees were the only devotees in India, ISKCON devotees. And he sent the article to Boston and gave a cover letter saying that uh, this is what the article is, and Sridhar Maharaj is Prabhupada's Siksha Guru. And here's the article. So Satsurup Maharaj wrote to Srila Prabhupada that we have this article uh, of Sridhar Swami, and is it all right to print? And um, should we mention that he's your Shiksha Guru, and, and so on? So Prabhupada said that, yes, the article could be printed, that the conclusions are the in, in agreement. There's, so it's understood that if we publish something in our magazine, we endorse the conclusions. He said, um, he said but it should be B.R. Sridhar Maharaj. He said Sridhar Swami was another man. Sridhar Swami, of course, was the original commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam. So he said Sridhar Swami is another, was another man. So it should be B.R. Sridhar Maharaj. And he said, tersely, he said, there is no need of mentioning Shiksha Guru in this connection. He'd written to Achyutananda Maharaj because someone had been canvassing him um, very improperly, trying to convince him that he needed a Shiksha Guru, namely this person who was doing the canvassing. So Prabhupada understood that this was an attempt to alienate Achyutananda from, from Prabhupada's connection and bring him into some other society. So Prabhupada told him to get out of there and sent him to Srila Sridhar Maharaj and said, had instructed him that if you're looking for a, Shri, for a Shiksha Guru, he's a person competent to be your Shiksha Guru. Even I consider him like my Shiksha Guru. So that was the basis of the letter that Achyutananda Maharaj had written us. But then when it came to publishing in Back to Godhead, said he's 
Prabhupada, Shikshu, Prabhupada said there's no need of mentioning Shiksha Guru in this connection. There were various things that Prabhupada didn't do that have somehow become institutionalized in ISKCON or, or conventional in ISKCON. Or, and we can mention some of them. One is that it's become a fashion for, or a, 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 a practice for devotees to chant their Gayatri mantra by taking their thread and placing it under their dhoti and then chanting. It seems that there was some statement in scripture, some, in a book someone had, had read, that the thread should not be visible and that you should cover it with your cloth, which I, I assume means with your, your top cloth. But anyway, it's become the practice for people to cover their thread with their dhoti. But Srila Prabhupada never did that. Prabhupada just took his thread and chanted. Sometimes he'd just keep his hand like that. Or you can see there's a picture in, in an old Easy Journey to Other Planets. Prabhupada just has his hand extended. You can see his fingers, his thread, everything. Prabhupada didn't put his hand under his dhoti to hide his, his thread. Sometimes devotees have the idea that before chanting each round, on the head bead, one should chant the Panchatattva mantra. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vashari Gaur Bhaktivinda. That's another thing that Prabhupada never instructed us to do. And I, I was at so many initiations, Prabhupada gave the instructions. So you start on this side of the beads and you chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. You reach the other side and you don't cross over. You turn around, you come back. In this way, one round, another round, another round. There was no Panchatattva Mahamantra. Prabhupada always did kirtan, in my experience, in the same way. In the morning, he would chant Gurvastakam, then Sri Krishna Chaitanya, the Panchatattva Mantra, and then the Hare Krishna Mantra. And then he would stop. He would begin very, very slowly. He would gradually, gradually, gradually build up speed. Then he would reach a crescendo, and then he would stop and chant Premadvani Mantra. And in the evening, when there was kirtan Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, back in the old days, Prabhupada would chant the entire Mangala Charana, all of the verses of the Mangala Charana, very slowly. And then he would chant Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Panchatattva Maha Mantra, then the Hare Krishna Mantra. And he would again build up the tempo, and then he would stop. There was nothing else in Prabhupada's kirtan. There were no Nitai Gaur Hari Bowls. There were no deity mantras, names. The Prabhupada loved the deities more than any of you, but he didn't chant any names of particular deities. These things were all added later. Prabhupada never referred to Subhadra Devi as Lady Subhadra. That seems to have been something that devotees have picked up on the British model. If it's, you know, if it's, if it's Lord Randolph, then it must be Lady Randolph. But Prabhupada, it was always Subhadra Devi, or never Lady Subhadra any more than it was Lady Radharani. It's not that because it's Lord Jagannath, it then becomes Lady Subhadra, and Lord Krishna and, and Lady Radharani unless we're going to enter into British titles of nobility with countesses and duchesses and, and so on. Someone asked Srila Prabhupada if the universal form was just for this universe or whether it encompassed many universes. Prabhupada said one universe is enough for you. Prabhupada had a, an exceedingly deep sense of, he showed an exceedingly deep sense of, of duty. He expressed so many times that he was carrying out his, his duty to his spiritual master. He, I, I related that story how Prabhupada conducted a big initiation and everyone was in ecstasy and Prabhupada just said that 
we have increased the parampara from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's a matter of duty. So Prabhupada was so balanced. He wasn't carried away by kind of giddy enthusiasm. He wasn't depressed by setbacks. He wasn't stopped by anything. He had a duty to perform. And he carried out that that duty. The personal praise and and gifts that were offered to him, he accepted as a matter of duty to offer to his spiritual master and through the parampara to Krishna. The translation that he did, the, the publishing that he did, his priorities, his training of his disciples, it was all in line with, his, with the duty that he'd been given by his spiritual master. And that duty Prabhupada performed with, with that such commitment and that I have that in mind as, as one meaning of gravity, that Prabhupada was very serious about, about the duties that he performed. At the same time, he was, he was joyful, he was so jolly, Prabhupada used that word, that a self-realized person, the first symptom is that he should be jolly. So Prabhupada was, was jolly, he could, could tell jokes, he could make plays on words, he could really relax and, and, and have a good time with the devotees. He could be cutting, he could be withering when he wanted to criticize. He could be sarcastic, he could be um, insistent, he could be so many things. But it was all in line with his, his duty as, as a servant of his spiritual master and, and a servant of Krishna. And at, at least at the moment that you're asking, that quality stands out in, in my mind. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Thank you.